really, really dangerous, irreversible choice that I would not have been able to take back. Because if it weren't for them, I would not be alive today. Fear drives the mills of modern man. Fear keeps us all in line. Fear of all those foreigners. Fear of all their crimes. Is this the life we really want? The beauty community has been affected by a disease of greed, lies and deception. There is corruption at the core of this community and one person has it on strings. They manage to exploit the drama community's weaknesses, hold a monopoly over how information flows, and manipulated millions with genius spin campaigns and tactics to shift public opinion. Drama is drama. It's a part of life. It should never go as far as almost taking life, and how Dramageddon happened still leaves a very sour taste in my mouth. This year, some sort of vindication was granted to James in the form of Carmageddon, and it's safe to say it did shake things up. Jeffrey and Shane's reputation took quite the hit after Tati Westbrook decided to rat on the pair for their involvement in Dramageddon. Of course, Shane also suffered extreme backlash for how he acted with children a few years earlier. Shane has struggled to return, making small cameos on his boyfriend's channel and releasing discounted merch onto his site. On the other hand, Jeffrey had the Morphe meltdown and has struggled to sell his products as effectively as he did before. His YouTube views are down, way down compared to before, and he has also found himself in more controversy relating to his past self. Jeffrey has had many chances to change his ways and better himself as a public figure. Shane will now be known as a person without integrity, someone who will sell out one friend to save face with another, regardless of the relationship's morality. Even so, before Tati released her sucker punch, Shane had preemptively left the beauty side of YouTube with a post on Twitter. His post paints the entire community as a tragic mess, comparing it to that of a circus. He also gives his statement on By Sister. He knew she was going to make it. He knew it could have been settled behind the scenes. He did nothing. He goes on giving a reason for why he's leaving the beauty community. But overall, it's just a load of nonsense. He came into a community, attached himself to one of the wealthiest creators, helped him to make a load of money, and when people don't like that, he ups and leaves because everything is too toxic. It's bitterly ironic. He eventually deleted the tweet because people saw through him, and quite frankly, karma served him a great big slice of humble pie. Five days after his post, he made a video in response to the overwhelming backlash, taking accountability for what he had done around children in the past. Three days later, YouTube decided to remove monetization from his channel in response to mainstream pressure. He had tried to evade this by removing over 1 billion views worth of videos, but it didn't change much. The conspiracy collection was removed from Morphe, essentially putting an end to all his work the year before. But it just got worse. A day after his demonetization, Tati dropped her video, and she blamed both men for Dramageddon. While I was definitely upset that he had accepted a sponsorship from the biggest rival to my brand, Halo Beauty, I did not make my video because of vitamins. I made it as a result of all of the poisonous lies that were fed to me by Shane Dawson and Jeffree Star. So the vast majority of our relationship was primarily by FaceTime, telephone, or texts. Sometimes weeks or months would go by without hearing anything from him, but I always heard from him when he was involved in drama or when he had a new launch about to happen. He also shared that Jeffrey had wanted me to have a small role in their docu-series, but the entire series was quickly changing because there was something horrible happening in our community with James Charles. He said that James Charles was a monster with many victims. I struggled with the decision to film my video for days. The night before I did film, Jeffrey sent me what he claimed was an audio file from an alleged victim and told me to listen to the pain in their voice. The audio was clearly a small portion of a larger conversation. It wasn't enough for me to contact the authorities. It was enough to scare me. Shane texted me back and said that I should not be nervous about the 50th floor, that James Charles was a narcissist and that he would never do that. 
In early May, when Jeffrey went on a podcast and denied responsibility for his involvement and placed blame on me, it was both cowardly and defamatory. Last week, when Shane issued his statements about his involvement in all of this, I also perceived them as cowardly and defamatory. Should I proceed with this course of actions? My attorneys will be deposing all witnesses who have information about the truth of what happened here. So for everyone else whose hands are dirty, that have not yet come forward, be careful of your allegiance. You don't want to be on the wrong side of the truth. This video is pretty damning, although we have to take a word with a grain of salt. However, what she explained does have merit and is believable. And towards the end of this investigation, it will help paint a pretty clear picture of what Jeffree Star is. Two weeks later, he would respond. What's up everybody, welcome back to my channel. Now, I've been silent for a very long time. I know that's very rare for me. I've taken a lot of time to do a lot of self-reflection. In typical Jeffrey fashion, he says what his fans want to hear, doesn't actually take accountability, and then completely shifts the attention away from what he did. It's what we call spin. He used racial injustice and the Black Lives Matter movement as a way of reframing the controversy and diverting the attention away from the issue at hand, downplaying it as petty drama. It is manipulation, and it's something Jeffrey has become very good at executing. It's one of the main reasons why he gets away with nearly every single controversy he finds himself in. It's why he has been able to move on from everything that happened last year, and why his counterpart Shane has failed to do so. At the end of the day, Jeffrey played everyone like a fiddle, and he got away with it. He managed to deceive not only Tati, but also many people entrusted with delivering the facts. Dramageddon was a result of Jeffrey's deep influence over the beauty and tea communities, and exposed how unreliable they are at getting things right. They played into his hand, and it worked out very well for him. The purpose of tea and drama channels is to keep people up to date with what's going on, and they function by holding those across the internet accountable for what they do. It is essentially self-regulation, and that is a good thing to have in a community where there are no standards for behaviour. The issue we have with many of these channels, however, is that they are unable to maintain their own standards as a collective. And this is how they can be exploited. This is what we saw during Dramageddon. Many of these creators immediately responded to the situation based on very little information, and that initially led them to crucify James Charles. As we know, the story was half true, and the serious allegations made against him were unsubstantiated and based on hearsay. Jeffrey went ahead and dropped a little more information, and yet again, they ate it up and spat it back out into the wild, playing into Jeffrey's hands. What happened is symptomatic of an overarching issue that was brewing within this community and the way information is interrogated. There was a lack of skepticism and people took the word of Tati as fact and rationalized it because of their preconceived opinions of James Charles. Here's a few examples of this in effect. But at this point, I am sick and f***ing tired of hearing about James Charles. I don't want to see his face anymore. I don't want to hear his name for at least a month before I can go and check up on him and see how he's doing with his new shade called Social Blade. It's this beautiful new red shade. It's available now for sale, so go and get it while stocks last and use code CANCELLED for 10% off. And can I just say one thing? I am not surprised one bit. It helps that my last two videos were videos just bashing James Charles. And now I can say with confidence that um, the hunch I had about him, I think was right. Tati's video was explosive because of the fact she had included the allegations that James was using his influence to manipulate straight men for his pleasure, something Tati was supposedly coerced into doing because of Jeffrey's audio file. This is what justified her making a video expose about vitamins, and her status in the community somewhat bolstered the credibility of these allegations. But there weren't any receipts, yet people ran with it. I think a lot of people are starting to jump on the bandwagon now, which they have been doing even before he was widely hated as he is now. And that stuff I can't stand behind. Hold him accountable to what he's actually done. 
pressuring straight people into doing stuff. Don't make up stories to make it seem like it's even crazier and more epic than it originally was. There are two factors that would explain why so many people entrusted with delivering good information and sharing credible opinions would be caught up by this so easily. The first is obviously the rush to get onto the story first, raking the views that will clearly come from such a big controversy. This then leads to videos being based on the partial truth, and any opinions conveyed would then be inaccurate, which is of course not very good for their credibility. The next issue is the integrity of those who are drama and tea channels and the way they hold themselves accountable. At the time, not many people owned up to being wrong in passing judgement before all the facts were on the table, and if a community is built on holding others to a certain standard, you would expect them to hold themselves to that as well. Unfortunately, that was not the case. The willful acceptance of what Tati and Jeffrey had to say before James made a proper response was negligent and exposed a deeper issue within the information community. A lot of my opinions still stand. I don't really trust any of them. So I didn't trust James in my, like up to my last James video. Didn't trust James. Now I don't trust any of them. So we've made progress, boys. I feel like just throw the whole beauty community in a bin and start again. Just hit restart. Uh, because this just, just isn't working, I'm sorry. They stooped below the standard of what is expected of a person trusted with responsibly sharing and analysing issues on the internet, and in the end, they helped Jeffrey to condemn James Charles. Jeffrey played into the drama tea community's weaknesses. He backtracked at the right moment and then spun the narrative into people just looking for blood. He still, to this day, has not revealed the audio file he has to the public, which was the evidence he claimed he had at the time but would not reveal. He diverted the attention away from this, claiming that he was relapsing on his old ways, and seemingly everyone bought it. At the same time, the drama and tea channels had made such a mess that no one really knew what was going on, so the saga came to an abrupt end and everyone seemingly went back to status quo. At the end of the day, drama and tea channels walked away carrying the bag they made from this drama with their tails tucked between their legs. And Jeffrey, yet again, got away with his deception. Before Tati exposed Jeffrey's puppeteering of Dramageddon, he was under the microscope for his inaction and behaviour back in the early 2010s. What came out is eerily similar to how he acted during Dramageddon, but it reveals a darker side to his character, and once Carmageddon finally turned its head, it really makes you question what Jeffrey knows. Darvi Vanity became the subject of scrutiny in early 2020 after he emerged to reignite his music career. Why is this a story? Well, Vanity was the frontman of the internet music group Blood on the Dance Floor, and well, he has been accused by 21 women of sexual misconduct, and was also warned in 2009 for similar accusations. Further, Jeffrey in 2010 had also distanced himself from Vanity and Blood on the Dance Floor, essentially tweeting about similar allegations. So when he popped up again, it became the talk of the community. This repulsive piece of garbage is trying to crawl back out from under the shadows and rebuild his career. This just disgusting monster, the worst person imaginable, is coming back with new merch, new music, his Instagram, his YouTube following is growing, and I am not having it. Today, I am going to be talking about Jeffree Star and his friendship and continued support of a person he knows to be a pedophile, Davi Vanity. Creepshow Art documented a timeline of this and highlighted that Jeffrey knew of Vanity's dodgy behaviour, had distanced himself from him, and then a year later decided to retract that so he could work with him again. Tamimi expanded on this, outlining the financial involvement he had with Vanity and comparing his actions with that of Dramageddon. He had either made false allegations, or worse, knowingly ignored actual abuse. A subplot to the story is the feud between Blair White and Tamimi. The latter released a video accusing White of using clips created by her, but purposely omitting information that would incriminate Jeffrey that was shown in these clips. Mimi shows us what Blur had left out, and clearly indicated the fact Jeffrey had worked with Vanity after branding him a predator. She suggests this may be in part due to White being on Jeffrey's PR list, which means you get every new release of his makeup for free, something a lot of drama and tea channels are a part of. Blur White herself would later dispute this idea, however Mimi thinks that this was calculated, and that Blur had purposely done this to cover for Jeffrey.
Yeah, and I think that's what a lot of people don't understand is that I don't have anything to report. If I actually saw and witnessed something, he would be rotting in jail this very moment. But I never saw anything besides inappropriate behavior. Like the things on stage at that time were not very uh, crazy. Looking back, it's very wrong, you know? But I never witnessed anything that could be used as evidence. And I think somehow people think I do and I'm not saying it. You're telling me today is that you never ever saw him commit statutory rape. Ever. No, a hundred percent not. I've never seen a sexual crime in person ever. Um, and it's offensive that people would suggest that. But I get that my tweets are very misconstrued. Um, they're loud and they seem a certain way. You called him though at that time some very nasty. Oh, I called him a child molester. A child molester. I mean you came right out and said this guy's yeah. why did you do it at that time? Because there was everyone talking it up like it was like like he was literally the devil and and looking back he is but at that time it seemed like everyone was gassing it up and as someone um that was very misunderstood in my music career and in uh my music and in my entire career um i felt a soft spot for them and i felt like you know people are just trying to villainize them like they've done to me um and i stupidly fell for that trap there's this like myth that somehow I worked with Davi again for financial uh, stability. Chris, when you tour and have a tour bus, that stuff is so expensive. I left that tour with really not any money. So for people to think that I did anything financial to work with them again, it's an actual joke. Um, so towards the end and on that entire tour in the year of 2012 and beyond, we were not friends. He was very jealous of my success of how things were growing for me um, and it just turned really bitter. Here we see Jeffrey effectively spin the situation to make himself look better. This is something that he does time and time again and he got himself out of the firing line far too easily for this. He reframed his past comments as him speaking on rumors rather than his own experience, although from what we see in the past tweets, it doesn't appear as if that's the case. It doesn't explain the abruptness of his severed ties other than it was from other people telling him, but then he also claims he was begged by others to work with Vanity again after the fact. It lays doubt on whether he's telling the truth, because he isn't holding himself responsible it also brings up questions about why he waited till Tati released her video on James to speak up about what he has supposedly seen. Yet, no one really picked up on that, and he used Tati as a Trojan to spread the idea James Charles did something and hid it behind evidence he would not release. What else is interesting is the way in which this story blew up. Jeffrey hadn't actively denounced vanity, he was caught sitting on his past actions and was amplified by the few channels that covered the story from the beginning. Jeffrey became a key target in this because if he had actively called out vanity's dirty deeds, but then backtracked and worked with him again knowing he was dodgy, his reputation would have been tainted indefinitely. So it comes as no surprise that he was able to redirect attention away from himself and onto other issues. This was how he used his appearance on Mum's Basement. With regards to Jeffrey's statement of seeing Vanity do inappropriate things with fans on the Hanson interview, here's what he had to say. I told him that I saw inappropriate things and people are taking that and running with it. Like, well, if you saw inappropriate things, you should have told some. No, I'm talking about like when you're dancing on stage, yeah, you grind on people, you slap their ass. It's, it's all, it was all part of the show. But when you tell someone that doesn't understand the rock world or that world, they take even what I'm saying right now out of context. Yeah. Although he claims to have seen Vanity grinding on young girls, this was normal because it was apparently a part of the scene back then, according to Jeffrey. So that naturally leads into his statements on Twitter calling Vanity a predator. Let me let me read the tweet that um, people are getting hung up on. Okay, so it's a it's yes. an old tweet from you, Jeffrey, that says, uh, "I'm going to speak the truth until I die." We saw um, Davi bring underage girls to his hotel room and do sexual things 100%. So that's the thing where they're like, yes, he and, saw. And yeah. Was that you assuming that that happened? No, that's people in the music scene telling me and me speaking for them. Okay. Did I see with my own eyes? No. He reframed these tweets as him speaking on rumors from people within the industry, yet he quite clearly suggests in these tweets that he has seen the truth. This opens up two possibilities. Jeffrey is an idiot and was easily influenced by other people, as he would have dropped Darvi on the word of others, but also went back to work with Darvi because of, according to him, the word of others. 
or he straight up lying through his teeth and managed to sell this narrative convincingly. What's interesting is that he didn't help platform any of the victims, rather went on to these interviews to clear his name. After leaving so many questions open on the pitiful Hansen interview, he used the mum's basement interview to direct focus onto what he wants people to think. He quite literally shifted the attention onto the drama channels that were criticizing him. I've seen a lot of videos on it and they are, a lot of them try, it seems like a lot. they're trying to send a lot of hate to Jeffrey, which the focus should be on this other guy. <laughs> like it really should be, um, but you know, it, it is what it is, you know. The algorithm, you know, YouTube, people with those views, <laughs> they, they need to... Uh, they do, and they need to pay their rent, but they're not donating any of the money to the victims, to any, to any lawyers to help them. They're pocketing it all, and that's what they're mad about. Jeffrey didn't even need to try with this one because Keeman Banks set it up for him. The criticism was his inaction to stop a predator after calling them out, but going back on what he had said and working with him until the day he finished music. He's being held accountable because he not only enabled Darby Vanity to prey on young fans, but he also did the same thing with James Charles and nobody knows what the truth is. He would go on to show Banks and Keem the audio file he has, yet they haven't acted on it. People were wanting answers, but that was spun into people using Jeffrey for views and money. What these interviews displayed was Jeffrey taking a pretty damning situation and then turning it around to suit his own needs. He managed to rationalize his past comments by deflecting the attention onto people other than himself, making it seem as if he was just given bad information, twice. Everything he did was all taken out of context because that's what people would do to him all the time. They'd use bad clips, but miss out the context. He makes it seem like the things he did weren't bad. It's just been misconstrued. So much that this whole situation was apparently gonna take away from the victims it was just for views and money, even though people wanted answers. He used two platforms other than his own to get his message across, and he didn't even have to do anything to help out the situation. He was there to spin the narrative, and quite frankly, he got away with it. Which raises the question of why this wasn't scrutinized by every single drama channel other than the ones initially holding him accountable. Well, it seems the reason would come out later in the year. On the 12th of June, Ashley Cow released the video I Was On Jeffree Star's Payroll, in which she would document how she played a part in the events of Dramageddon. Now, there's often murmurings of some sort of payroll that Jeffree Star has. There's an idea that he pays drama YouTubers to feed out information that makes him look better in certain dramas. Whether or not this is true is irrelevant, because what Ashley reveals is just as bad as if there were a physical payroll. She goes on to reveal messages she had received from Jeffree that alluded to the possibility of something big coming after James Charles' Sugar Bear Hair shout out. Having that rapport with Jeffrey, I believed him. Like in my heart, I believed something was up with James Charles. And my mind automatically went back to Manny. Like, oh, did he use you? Like, it never went to where Dramageddon 3 went, or 2, I'm sorry. It never went there. Like, never in a million years did it go there. So I said, um, oh my God, Jeffrey, you have me shook right now. You were so close to him. And he said, we all were. Shane, Tati, the Dolans, Emma, we are all done. And I said, wow, that's disappointing. I had a lot of hope for him. Now, so like I said, I believed him and I pried. What she shows throughout this video is the distribution of curated information by Jeffrey that tips off these drama channels to certain stories that are developing within the community. What's more is that this kind of communication had led to her trusting Jeffrey more than she should have, and that in turn led to her taking his comments as fact rather than opinion. But she wasn't alone. On a live stream on Edwin's second channel, Petty Page revealed how Jeffrey would use his status to essentially bully drama channels into submission. When he goes over and he speaks to each of the drama channels individually, he'll feed them information that they can't tell the public. Right. So he'll say he'll say something like, this is what happened, here's the tea, here's my truth, and you understand, you believe him, and then it's just kind of like, but I can't run to the internet and say this because there are other people implicated, there are... So it, Right. Situation where you're staying silent on a situation that's actually bigger than you. And then it's so, I'm going to be honest, it's somewhat selfish to do that because it means that the drama channels then become silenced. Because I've been told information that I can't share with the universe, I'm kind of stuck with it. So right. I know it, he knows it, 
not speaking about it the people implicated don't want him to speak about it so now i'm stuck so right. i can't report that drama yeah. i can't tell that truth I can't explain to you why is that he decided to say what he wanted to say in these kind of situations he did that to not just me he did that to a bunch of other drama channels which left us silenced because if we spoke out and went with the majority of the opinion that was put out there um then we would have just been knowingly going against some information that we already knew privately or the other option was to out information that was not ours to out. This kind of behavior then shines some light on the comments made by Tati in her video in late June. He would frequently comment about how much dirt he held on other brand owners and members of our YouTube community. I believe that he actually held blackmail material on many people and was capable of destroying the entire community. This worried me about him and I stayed and I tried my best to be a positive influence. But we aren't finished there. Two days prior, Blur White had come out with her own experience with Jeffrey, and she revealed that he had done this exact thing to her. Then Jeffrey proceeds to tell me, James will never attack me because I have this on him. I have shit on everyone. Which he has said publicly before, I have shit on everyone. Because I have dirt on everyone and they know to keep their mouths shut. I don't view something like this as gossip that you hold over someone's head or whatever. This is something serious. This is a crime. And just the fact that he's blackmailing people with this is disgusting. And the fact that I am expected to hold on to this information as well. And just the shocking fact that this is our first interaction ever and he's telling me this. I'm like, how many other people know this and have heard this voice memo and, and know that this is the truth? According to her, Jeffrey's piece of evidence is blackmail against James Charles that supposedly out someone as being indecently assaulted by him. She was shown this and now knows the truth, stuck with the dilemma of looking like the bad guy if she were to reveal the story. What's more is that the alleged victim does not want to come forward meaning that this is one very complicated situation. But nevertheless, Jeffrey has basically condemned White to silence while simultaneously holding blackmail over James's head. The pieces are starting to fall together. Jeffrey's behind the scenes antics are like that of a puppeteer and he uses his influence to manipulate others into either revealing information he wants known or ensuring they never cross his path. By doing so, not only is he wrapping the distributors of information around his fingertips, but he is cultivating a dangerous ideology within a community that is literally just supposed to play with makeup. Drama channels like Ashley Kyle were used by Jeffrey to paint James as an evil character before all the facts were known, and this was in part due to a very unethical relationship with the source of information. So I was trying then to pull away. I knew in my heart I was trying to pull away because something, something in my gut just doesn't feel right. And I don't know what it is. I don't, is it his past? Is it that I, who he is today? I don't know what it is, but something in my gut does not feel right anymore. So stupid, so stupid. We can comfortably say that after seeing what he's done, it's not unreasonable to view Jeffrey as the figurehead of deception in the beauty community. What's more is that he inspires something many can't achieve, an endless bounty of wealth and a lifestyle that's unrestricted and rather eccentric. So when he goes around tipping people off about potential money makers and feeding information to exclusive creators, this idea of being able to live comfortably takes the forefront of the imagination. As Kyle reveals, the cost of their integrity as someone meant to hold others accountable was nearly $40,000. So many of you have asked me, and I've seen the questions on Twitter, what, what it costs to be, you know, what I got paid to be on his payroll, especially during Dramageddon. The answer to that question was $37,162.24. That is what I made during Dramageddon 2 that May. And, um, it's not worth it. It's, it's dirty money and, um, all because I believed Jeffrey and, you know, <laughs> I feel terrible about it. From this, it's safe to assume that many people across the board prospered very well from what took place in May of 2019. Jeffrey may not have physically paid them to help drag James Charles, but he definitely preyed on the community's lack of integrity 
which would be questioned about a month later. On the 23rd of May, popular beauty YouTuber Jaclyn Hill announced she was launching her own cosmetics line on the 30th. But this would release with several shades of lipsticks, and the announcement was well received with a total of more than 220,000 likes. But within a few weeks, everything would go tipped up with many fans and creators complaining about contamination of her products. It even went as far as a petition being launched calling on the FDA to investigate and recall the products. Hill's response to the situation created a nightmare for her, as she responded to tweets in a rather rash and unprofessional manner, with much criticism levied at her for insisting her products were safe, although many people were reporting contamination. As you'd expect, every drama, T-Channel and their pet dog covered this drama extensively and rightfully held Jaclyn Hill accountable. Believe it or not, teen drama channels actually have an essential function within the beauty community. They are consumer protection, and that is something that really needs to be credited. This idea was evidence as Ashley Carroll released two videos discussing the contamination of the Jeffree Star and Shane Dawson conspiracy palette. In the first video, she reported on fibres and hairs being found within the product, and an issue with the replacements of those that are contaminated. However, in her follow-up video, she compares the response of a Jeffree Star cosmetics representative to the Jaclyn Hill situation. Now also in reply to this tweet, another person replied with their correspondence between Jeffree Star Cosmetics and herself. But basically she's asking if the lip balm itself is supposed to be an exfoliating lip balm and that she was just inquiring about it and she's very, very kind. They actually responded with our quality review team has looked at your claim and the situation unfortunately does not pertain to a defect of the product. Since the lip balm has a creamy consistency we suggest that your lips are exfoliated and completely bare upon application. So this Jeffree Star customer service associate actually replied to this customer and told her that the reason why her lip balm is bumpy is because her lips are chapped. Another beauty and tea YouTuber by the name of Skeleton also made a video on another issue found by drama YouTuber Spillsesh, and he credits Jeffree for how he responded to her complaint, again comparing it to Jaclyn Hill. The whole thing though, um, I think was handled really well by Jeffrey actually because he tweeted back to Spill Session and said, I'm so sorry how the situation was handled. That does not reflect our company's personal policies. We are handling this internally, but in the meantime, please direct message me so I can send you a new palette right now myself. I think that that is great ownership, you know, of the problem. I think that he is handling the situation great. Like, I feel like that's way better than Jaclyn Hill would have been handling the situation. One more creator, known as Amanda Double B, would make a video days after the original reporting of the contaminated palettes, and she raised concerns about the coverage of the contamination. Like everyone, no matter who you stand, matter who you didn't stand, dragged her collectively. But we have the exact same situation going on right now, and it's crickets. It's literal crickets. Nothing is happening. And I counted how many videos they had made about the Jaclyn Hill lipstick gate, and I decided to see how many videos they made about the situation. So first we'll start off with T-Spill. T-Spill made three videos about Jaclyn Hill's lipstick situation, and zero about this current Jeffree Star Shane Dawson one. The Viewer's Voice made 22 videos about Jaclyn Hill. About, not about hers, about the lipstick situation. 22 videos and one about this Jeffree Star thing. Dustin Daly, eight, eight videos about Jaclyn Hill and one about Jeffree Star. This is pretty much true. Going through YouTube looking for any coverage of the Conspiracy Collection's contamination will only yield a few results. But if you look for Jaclyn Hill, you will be given pages upon pages of videos. Considering most drama and tea channels will cover the slightest of comment from Jeffrey, it's quite interesting that hardly anyone touched this. It raises more questions than answers because there is no consistency when it comes to Jeffrey. Are they scared of him? Or do they just not care whatsoever? 
Jeffrey is very much invested in ensuring he has control of the information that flows within the community, whether it be in the form of extra tips or just blatantly holding information over the heads of others. It's not unreasonable to think he purposefully manipulates creators to serve his own agendas, be it in flaunting his wealth and friendship or just demanding people correct the record as if it is their duty to do right by him. I would never trust a word that comes out of his mouth, because time and time again, he has been able to spin situations to suit himself and deceive not only his fans, but also those supposed to hold him accountable. His various lies, attempts to discredit the truth and just blatant abuse of power hints at his desire for control. At this point in time, his wealth and influence grants him such a thing, but it's only a matter of time before he's truly caught out. One such obstacle is a well-funded and credible publication, of which is now restoring a sense of integrity into the internet drama sphere, and they have exposed the depths of Jeffrey's control. What we have seen throughout this investigation is a pattern of behavior that has been able to twist and convert the public opinion, which could only lead to a conclusion that Jeffrey is a very manipulative character. It's very hard to name one controversy where he's actually conceded that he is the problem. By combining his ability to spin narratives and his puppet master status, he has weaseled his way out of so many damning situations that would have ruined most people. Shane and Tati are still suffering from the aftermath of Dramageddon, whereas Jeffrey is out and about in Wyoming. Of course, as the years go on, there will be more focus on him as he continues to expand, and this was evidently apparent late last year. To really emphasize this idea of Jeffrey's control, we will take a look at the insider investigation into claims he had been physically violent with people in his MySpace days. The investigation, led by Kat Tembarge, a journalist bringing the standards of journalism to issues within these online communities, began around the same time Jeffrey appeared on Hanson and Mum's basement. Over four months, she looked into old stories and eventually found people willing to speak out against Jeffrey's star. So for these four months, she had built up a pretty strong story with multiple sources compounding these allegations. This was up until the point that the key source decided to recant, retracted a statement which could have entirely derailed this investigation. That's one thing that happened. I wonder what changed their minds so quickly. During this, Jeffrey and his legal team were made aware as they shared email exchanges regarding the allegations. This is something every journalistic organization does. They offer the other side a right of reply to give balance to the story. It turns out that after they were informed of the detailed allegations for some unexpected reason, the key source recanted. In fact, most of the people interviewed decided that they had changed their mind, which kind of raised concerns for how this may have happened. Well, it turns out that two of the sources were contacted by Gage Arthur, the key source of the story, and he claimed that he had recanted his allegations and told Insider not to publish them. He then informed one of the other sources that they would receive $10,000 for also retracting their stories, and asked another for help finding the others who spoke out. A cunning plan that kind of fell short. Once you've gone on the record, whatever you've said is fair game and can be published. And published it was with a whole new angle. Now this could just be a coincidence, but about a week before this article was published, Jeffrey was giving away $10,000 to three random people on his Twitter, as long as they gave him a good reason to do so. The $10,000 could surely just be a coincidence, but this giveaway raised Jeffrey up in the eyes of many. Look at this charitable man giving away his pocket money during a global pandemic. His name was trending for all the right reasons. What's more of a coincidence is that a day before the article was released, Jeffrey was embroiled in some pretty big drama. He had a new man hanging around, people were interested in this new affair as it was with a black man, something that was interesting due to his past accusations of racism. What's more is that this new man, who was an international basketball player, stated after the fact that he didn't actually know who Jeffrey was when they began talking. When you slid in the DM, were you sliding in the DM because you were you wanted to have sex with Jeffrey, because you wanted an opportunity with Jeffrey, or because you were actually interested in getting in with I, Jeffrey? I, right? I, didn't, I didn't slip in Jeffrey's um, DMs. I didn't know who Jeffrey was. So I really just liked a couple of pics of then something he, I seen on slid. Instagram. He slid in my DMs. And, and we got to talking, and, and since I didn't know who he was, mm -hmm. I wasn't really entertaining it. So I just like I didn't even get to know who Jeffrey was until the picture was dropped. 
They had been together for a few weeks, and a day before the article was released, by some coincidence, they had explosively broken up. This was supposedly due to Marhold finding dirt on Jeffrey, and in contrast, Marhold had stolen a bag. When this happened, everyone was talking about it. It was trending, and all the attention was on this incident. So, out of pure coincidence, not only was Jeffrey giving away $10,000 to three people, but also had this big controversy in the same week in which the article that was describing allegations made against him and the money he paid to try and silence it was released. Of course, Jeffrey's legal team painted it as false and defamatory, shifting the blame onto how Kat had conducted her investigation. But a month or so later, a check for $45,000 that was addressed to the key source surfaced online. This leak also included the supposed conditions within a settlement reached with Jeffrey's legal team that he would be paid $25,000 for attempting to retract his allegations, in addition to $20,000 that he would be paid for contacting two of Insider's other sources and getting them to do the same. It may be suggested then that Jeffrey had paid these people off to try and invalidate their accusations, and if they didn't take the money, who knows what Jeffrey's legal team would have done to them. So it's clear their voices were silenced. The lawyers discrediting Kat's integrity and suggesting Insider was acting out of malice was also another diversion. But if we bring every single circumstance together, and we keep in mind everything we have discussed in this video, it would not be unreasonable to draw the conclusion that Jeffrey had done everything in his power to derail the story from coming out, and did everything he could to discredit everyone involved in the investigation. He's made it very clear to everyone that he has the money to throw around, and that if someone comes forward, they may face the same treatment. This is the level of degeneracy he is willing to go so he can control the narrative. He didn't give it any public notice and let his lawyers do the talking, and that is the first time I have seen him do this. It's not unreasonable to think that he indirectly threw whatever he could at this story to divert attention, because I believe this is one that he would not have been able to spin. The term uncancellable has been coined as a direct result of this man. He's been at this for two decades and is only going to continue growing. The only way he will be stopped is if every aspect of the community came together to oust him, but the corruption runs so deep that it just appears to be a lost cause. We have seen time and time again the ways which Jeffrey manipulates people into viewing him the way he wants. He has made people scared of him, to the point they don't even want to hold him accountable. As long as he maintains his monopoly on the information flow, and has the available funds to keep any detractors silent, he will be at the top. It may be cliché to refer to him as a sinister overlord, but he's not afraid to hide his identity. Taking him on is a monumental task, and although D'Angelo Wallace got close, it's going to take more for anything to truly make change. This is the state of the beauty community and it is an irreparable mess.